here we are. Welcome everybody. Welcome. And welcome to me as well. Uh, <clears throat> I'm feeling a little run down today because as I think I probably mentioned to some of you, uh, it's allergy season over here in my neck of the woods in Northern California. But nevertheless, I shall endeavor to answer your questions that you were so kind as to post. So if I look off to the side, it's because I've got the questions queued up over here. Please forgive me and my, uh, and my temporary frequent need to, to glance over here to check into the questions. So one question that I got asked was by M.K. Hahn, and I'm going to read it. She says, um, <clears throat> How do we get out of our own heads to appreciate that what we have is unique and may be of value to a tribe? We have the most intimate relationship of all with ourselves, in our minds, built on a timeline, a, a lifetime of internal conversations, rants, and opinions. It is challenging, for me at least, to see that I have anything unique and valuable to offer. I have a deep-seated desire to help others by offering advice and observations about what I see. But I don't see my own uniqueness because it is so familiar to me and it is my normal. I assume everyone has what I have and more. I find it challenging to see reflections of myself in people's feedback. So, there's a lot in there. Okay, There's more than one question in there and there's more than one answer for that. <laughs> so, let's start with how do we get out of our own heads and appreciate that what we have is unique and maybe of value to a tribe. Any idea that what you have is not unique is a product of fundamentally your inner, your inner dialogue, which Macon Jewel Henson will attest is... Uh, it's the voice that constantly plays in your head, tells you not to do things. It tries to limit and protect you by talking you out of doing anything. Um, so talking you out of the idea that you do have a unique and valuable contribution would fit neatly into that. Each of us has a unique and valuable contribution. It's just the way it is. That needs to be accepted on its face. You are not so special that you don't have a unique and valuable contribution to make, okay? That in and of itself would actually be unique if you were the one person who didn't have something unique to say. Do you see how it's not even possible? Because by being not unique, you'd be unique because we are, in fact, all of us, we have something. We have a perspective. We have uh, a point of view. We have a, a shading of experience that makes what we can share unique. Uh, just look at all the stories people have shared here. There are similar themes running through these stories, and yet each one has its own flavor, character, impact. Um, uh, it, it hits us in a different way. So let's dispel with the idea that any of us are not unique and that we don't have something to share. It's up to you to find it, and it's up to you to have faith that it will affect people positively. I mean, the underlying assumption is we're here to make positive change, not negative change. So that's that. Um, <clears throat> there's much that could be said on how to control change, come to sort of uh, be in charge of our inner dialogues. And um, I'm not going to go into that here. Just know that it is a function of your self-image, which is uh, sort of the... The inner dialogue is the spokesperson for your self-image to think that you don't have uh, anything valuable to share. Okay? Oh, hey, MK. Hi. <laughs> so, each of us has something valuable and unique to share. And we need to start off by just accepting that premise. Okay? Second, um, where is it? It's challenging, at least, for me to see that I have anything unique and valuable to offer. That's what we were just talking about. I have a deep-seated desire to help others by offering advice and observations about what I see, but I don't see my own uniqueness because it's so familiar and it's my normal. Um, I would suggest that if you have a deep-seated desire to help others, perhaps offering advice and observations is not 
the first thing you should do, okay? Um, we have to build trust, rapport, and bond with people before they will let their natural defenses down enough that we can offer advice and, and insights. Um, in this format of speaking through Facebook or even the live stream format is very contrived. It's very artificial. It has a lot of value, but it's very artificial. But you have to understand that if you really want to help people, you have to first be vulnerable. You have to create the vulnerability, hold the space for a level of vulnerability that you'd like them to have. Okay? And when that happens, when those walls and defenses kind of go down on both sides, then there's a natural ability that occurs to be able to offer help, guidance, insight. And, um, and it feels very different. Hi, Viviana. It feels very different that, uh, <clears throat> than what we're used to when we try to give people advice and it doesn't seem to land. So giving advice is perhaps akin to putting jalapenos in your cooking, right? Um, you want to be very, very careful because just a little bit of it can be delicious. Too much of it, the whole dish is ruined. <laughs> so another thing, MK. Wow, Viviana, it's 1 a.m. there and you tuned in. I'm honored. Another thing that MK asks is, or states is, one thing that has emerged lately is looking at what triggers an emotion in me when I connect or just observe others. I am now assuming that these triggers are really a reflection of something in me. That is a correct assumption. Anytime we are triggered by another person's attitudes, views, or behaviors, it's because there's something in us that we're not okay with. That can be a little confusing at first, by the way. It can be a little confusing to just go, oh, it must be something in me, and, and you know, getting to the bottom of it is a little more um, investigative than just the accepting that that's probably how things are. Be patient with yourself on that. Be soft with yourself on that. Be pliable with yourself on that. And let it come. Let it come to you. Don't force it. Uh, the, the likelihood of you recognizing right away what it is that's in you that allows you to get triggered by another person's behavior is very small. It's a very small likelihood that you'll just sort of pick up on that. Uh, but you remember when I talked about the difference between authenticity and self-awareness, courage, and vulnerability. As you apply, as a regular discipline, self-awareness, courage, and vulnerability, you will find that you naturally discover these triggers, and oftentimes you'll discover them out of the context of being triggered by another person. So what might happen as an example is, let's say a, a family member triggers you, because that's a big one. Um, you, you may find that as you're doing your, your combination of self-aware, courageous, and, and vulnerable, that suddenly the dynamic just changes. It just becomes easier. Not because you sort of aimed your energy at changing that relationship, but because you yourself have fundamentally changed. So that's kind of the, uh, the, the, guiding, you know, the guiding idea there. Now, um, uh, one more from, from you, MK. How do we laser in on what we have that is valuable so that we don't waste our life hours on inconsequential pursuits? I actually have a system for being able to reveal the pieces of ourselves the interests that we have, the passions, and those things that, that could constitute a life's mission, a life's work. It's way too much to cover here. It's, I couldn't even come close. But suffice to say, if you can go through the structure uh, day of the challenge, then you will have gone through and you will have picked out moments in your life that tell your story. Likewise to that, to start to uncover what it is that we're sort of might consider, uh, you know, our sweet spot or what we do or the things that we could dedicate our lives to or, or mission, purpose, passion, those things. Um, the, the, the way to start that is to go back through your life and look at what did you always gravitate toward doing? 
what different things, and they, they don't have to be the same on the surface. But you want to start from where you are now and move back in different, you know, um, time periods of your life and say, well, what did I always like to do? Or what did I like to do during this point in my life? The things that you would have done if you didn't get paid. The things you naturally gravitated toward. Then you need to look at all of those when they're laid out in front of you and start to ask yourself the question, what do these all have in common? So that's just a, a thin slice off the top of that process. I hope that helps. Um, Viviana asks, says, there are three things that intrigue me. One, how to tap into the inner power of our voice. Ah, Viviana, uh, speak in my language. How to use power words to enhance our presentation. And how to get our audience to become raving fans. Well, oh, it looks like there's a fourth, actually. Where is my little cursor? Here we are. Last but not least, number four, how do you infuse joy in your words? These are such good questions. <laughs> they make me joyous. I'm always the doer, the no-nonsense kind of person, to the point that I don't like those. I don't like to use too many words, or people who use too many words. I always strip my conversations to the bare minimum. I also do the same with people whom I feel are being too wordy. Well, it sounds like you're both aware of that, and it sounds like uh, you recognize that maybe it's not a way that you want to continue to be. I'm not sure if I'm right about that or not, but that's what it sounds like. So, the good news is, tapping into the inner power of your voice, using power words to enhance your presentation, will create uh, your audience becoming your raving fans. So, so, the answer to the third question was in the application of the first two. Uh, now, the last one, Viviana, you say, how do we infuse joy in our words? Well, are you saying that you want to include more joy in your words because it says you say you're always the doer and the no-nonsense kind of person. Does that mean that you recognize that you'd like to be able to have it to have it in your ability to um, come across as more joyful? Am I right about that? And I guess for that matter are you still there? <laughs> I can't tell. Um, Okay, so tapping into the inner power of your voice, I think in the most simplest, in the most simple way, we need to do a couple of things. We need to first make sure that we don't speak um, in a high-pitched voice, like from our, from our mouths outward. Hi, Kay. It's very important that we have... Uh, we use what is called our dominant tone. Most of us don't know what that is. Sorry about that. Of those who know what it is, very few know how to use it. Um, and so the dominant tone is the tone at which you create the most vibration and resonance in your voice. Now, I can't know whether or not you're doing that because we've only ever uh, communicated via text and typing, but tapping into this dominant tone is a massively powerful thing. Uh, for instance, this is my normal speaking voice now, but before I learned this, I used to talk up here all the time. And I had it in my nose a little bit. My voice was a little bit in my nose. Kind of like this. And I gotta tell you, that's not as pleasing as this. Can you hear the difference between this and this? Now, the three of you who I can see are on the call may all be saying, yes, but I'm a woman. Guess what? Doesn't matter at all. Um, the voice that vibrates in the chest and in the throat is far more pleasing to everyone than the voice that is high-pitched uh, bordering on nasally. So that's one, Viviana. Um, power words. Ah, power words. Well, I guess the question you ask is, how do I use power words to enhance my presentation? You simply use them. That's how you do it. Remember, um, I talk a lot about contrast, right? And if you, you, you need to create contrast with your words, as well as your tone, as well as your body language, as well as the imagery you use, the idea of contrasting 
runs through all levels of communication. And, you know, that's why I don't uh, tailor the way I speak so as not to possibly offend someone, right? If it's if the right word in my mind at that time is an F-bomb, an F-bomb goes there. If the right word in my mind at that time is something else that I know might be a little shocking, it goes there. It's not so much that I can be powerful, right, or be controversial. It's just, it's two things. One, I want to be myself. And two, I know that when you create a certain level of discourse and then you put a big punchy word in there, like, a, let, let's use cuss words as an example. It, it has a lot of impact. You know, again, it's like cooking with jalapenos, right? So that is, uh, that's my quick two cents on the power words. And when you do those things, in fact, getting your audience to become your raving fans, which was your third question, is going to be a byproduct, um, a byproduct of learning all of these things. Your storytelling, in which we have gone to great depth, although there is more. I mean, you know, you guys are still welcome and encouraged to join me for deeper training, but the storytelling along with the vocal tonality, Viviana, I think that might be a really, a really nice one for you. And then of course, body language too. Once you understand all three of these together and how to connect them, you become the kind of person who, as you put it, gets our audience to become our raving fans. So last but not least, Viviana, you say, how do you infuse joy in your words? You simply smile. That's it. You simply smile, you pay attention to the tone, and you learn to mimic that tone. See that? That smiling tone I just put in there? That's how you do it. Uh, MK Han says she pulled over at the park to listen, but internet connection is glitching. She's running home and she'll be back up in a few minutes. Uh, I, I don't know if you're still here, MK, but uh, because I'm feeling a little sort of uh, beset by allergies, that's going to be it for this call. So um, I hope you get a lot out of it. Thank you guys for tuning in and asking the questions. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the answers. All right. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks very much.